This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Selling a little or a lot? Do your thing however you cha-ching with Shopify, the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. Get a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash offer 23. Bienvenidas al podcast Dos Bold Latinas. Aquí están sus hosts, Jat Nabreu y Josibel Madera Vialet, dos latinas feministas born in Santo Domingo y en New York. Passionate about Latina empowerment, Spanglish, learning, growth, and so much more. Hola mujeres, en este episodio de este mes estaremos hablando de la importancia de la salud mental en nosotras las latinas. No es un secreto de que en la cultura latina la enfermedad mental es un signo de debilidad. Muchos piensan que es un problema personal y se debe de mantener callado. According to the U.S. Mental, Cultural, Race, and Ethnicity Report, only 20% of Latinos with a mental disorder talk about it with a primary care physician. And only 10% pursue treatment from a mental health provider. Amazing. So, en el día de hoy, tenemos una invitada super especial, la cual practica psicología, especialmente en la comunidad latina de Grand Rapids. Y le estaremos haciendo una entrevista para aprender un poquito más de por qué es tan importante el cuidar de nuestra salud mental como mujeres, and most importantly, como Latinas. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce and interview both Latina therapist Loana Abreu, MA and TLP. Would you mind um, uh, kind of like letting people know, know what MATLLP means before I go into, you know, like your bio? Mm -hmm. um, so... Hi, everyone. My name is Longna Breyu, and MA st um, stands for a master's. I'm a master's level therapist. And the TLP means like what type of license I have, which is I'm a temporary, temporarily limited licensed psychologist. Awesome. Thank you. So Loana was born and raised in the Dominican Republic. And by the way, she's my sister, my baby sister. So I'm super proud of her. And um, she migrated to Grand Rapids, Michigan at the age of 12. She has a bachelor's of science and a minor in Latin American studies from Grand Valley State University and a master's in counseling psychology from Western Michigan University. Loana currently works at River City Psychological Services and is currently the only bilingual and Latinx therapist at this private practice. She has experience working in community mental health and some other Some of her specialties are working with individuals with substance abuse, PTSD, postpartum depression, trauma-informed care, anxiety, depression, self-esteem, stress, women's issues, acculturation, assimilation, and many other things. She sees a variety of cultures but caters to minority groups such as Latinx, African Americans, and the LGBTQ plus community. She has experience working with all ages, so from zero to um, elderly. And Loana has a passion towards breaking the stigma of mental health, um, especially among the Latinx and African-American communities. And she enjoys educating others about mental health and empowering minority groups. Loana spends her free time doing um, self-care and loves to spend time with her nephews, meaning one of them is my son. <laughs> all right. So we're going to go ahead and um, interview Loa. And again, today we're going to talk about basically the importance of mental health and why um, it's actually more important in the Latina community, um, just because there's a lot of stigma in that. And so we want to make sure that we get the right information for Loa, since she has a lot of um, knowledge in that area. And we, she's going to share with us, like, you know, kind of like her passion and some of the things we should be doing to also help our community 
um, when it comes to mental health awareness. So we're going to go ahead and ask you the first question, Loa. Welcome, Loa. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am so excited, me personally, to learn more about mental health in the Latina community. So to start Thank you out, for having me. So to start out, tell us a little bit about your background and why you have such a passion for mental health. And what does it mean to you as a Latina? Well, um, so for my passion for psychology started when I was in high school and I took my first psychology class. Um, and it's just at the moment when we, when I was in the classroom, they were teaching us about like serial killers and things like that. And I just thought it was so interesting how the mind works and like human behavior and how every behavior has a reason and why we do certain things a certain way. And since that day on, I think I was like 14 or 15 at the time and I was just like intrigued and passionate and obsessed about it and more so because I feel like that is a topic that I didn't know about or that like my family didn't mention to me before and I didn't know much about so I felt like I had to go out of my way to find out these answers and see um, what else is there for me to find out. And as a Latina, mental health means to me owning my struggles and being able to overcome them and being okay with asking for help, especially when it comes to the mind and the things we have no idea how to control or understand. Wow, that's, that's awesome. So um, the next question is, why do you think there is such a big stigma in the Latinx community about mental health? Um, there is this notion about machismo and, you know, men don't cry. If you seek therapy, eso es para loco. Like, you must be crazy if you're going to a therapist. And I think there's also a misconception between a therapist and a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist is someone that can um, prescribe medication. And a therapist, we do not prescribe any medication. So therefore, you're not seeking me because you're crazy. You're seeking me because you must be going through something in your life. And therefore, you need guidance on it. So I just want to distinct that to everyone because when I think, when I tell people, oh, I'm a psychologist or a therapist, they think, oh, so you can prescribe me this, this and that. And I do not prescribe any medication to anyone. Um, and also, I feel like with the stigma, it goes way back to like our ancestors and the lack of education around it in the sense that at least per my experience and per the experience of my Latinx friends and the clients that I had before, um, they tell you when you have a problem, you fix it within your family, all your elders or your church or pastors. But what happens when your mental health is being affected by your family members or the issues that are that you're going through are created by your family members or your pastors doesn't have a degree or knowledge on how to deal with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia and all this stuff. Like, how can you go to someone when they don't have the expertise to be able to help you? Agreed. Excellent. So true. And also as Latina, as a Latina, is déjaselo a Dios que te va a ayudar. Pero es and I mean, ayuda that's que, great, yes. you know, but at the end of the day, if you don't, yeah, you can pray. Some things you can just pray it away. Like depression mm -hmm. is something that once you're going through it, you don't even know why you feel the way that you feel and how to help yourself. You can pray about it. That might help you, but you're still dealing with that depression, if that makes sense. Yes, preach, girl. Excellent. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> so leads us to number three. Why do you think it's important to destigmatize mental health in the Latinx community? I think it's important because the least we treat these issues, the more it holds us back and the more likely we're to develop another co-occurring disorder and affect our functioning in our daily life, like being moms, being a wife, being a sister. Like if you're not mentally stable, how can you be good to others? But also it's important because it is okay to ask for help, to reach out, to understand that your friends are not your therapist. And that sometimes to overcome an illness, you need to understand the illness itself and seek professional help. It's great when you go to your best friend, to your sister, to your aunt, to your comadre, but at the end of the day, if they don't know what the hell you're going through, how can they help you if you're going through something real and you don't understand it yourself? Sometimes you need professional help. 
and it's okay to ask for help. So based on what you just said, um, Loa, about, um, you know, like if you don't seek the therapy you need, um, how could you be, a, you know, a wife, a sister, or a mom? Um, do you think, so based on that, the, the next question kind of like leads to asking you, so based on your experience, do you think that Latina women are affected more by mental health issues than Latino men are? And if so, why is that? You would think so, since I've treated more Latino women than Latino men, but that would in itself says a lot. Um, and that goes back to machismo and the lack of education and who actually decides to trick, um, to, trick um, to seek treatment. I feel like it would be unfair for me to say that one gender seeks therapy than the, like, the other one, because at the end of the day, it comes to up to the person, you know? So I, I don't feel comfortable saying Latina women seek more therapy than men, because in my experience, yes, because I do see more women than men, but I think it affects them both at the same rate, if that makes sense. But, um, you know, following up to that question, though, but you, do you think that, um, or, or is it a stigma that we feel like Latina women should probably be the ones that are experiencing a lot more mental health problems because um, of everything, like the workload and everything that they have to do as women? Like, is that just like an assumption? Or do you think that... Um, it's it's really not it's just like the it's very equal to like men and women getting the same treatment as latinos i think when it comes to men and women just overall we have different roles so therefore we might have certain mental health issues that affect us differently in the sense that you know especially within the latino community uh, women are supposed to stay home and take care of the kids and cook and do this and do that and especially now millennials like we work we are moms we have to teach our children, especially with the pandemic, we have to be a mom, cook, work, and take care of the kids too. So I feel like more than likely, you might be more prone to being affected by feeling like stressed, overworked, tired, having relational issues within your partner because of all the pressures and expectations that society is putting on you and that men and your um, partner puts on you. Thank you. So spoke a little bit about genders. Now let's talk a little bit about cultural backgrounds. So what are some unique challenges you may experience with Latina clients compared to other clients from different cultural backgrounds? Um, the challenges that I am going to mention, I think are not as specific to gender, but just overall within the Latinx community. So some of the challenges are like cost and insurance. So therapy is very expensive. And some people, like some therapists, they do like a sliding scale, meaning that they don't charge you based on your income or based on what you can afford. And some therapists can do pro bono, meaning that they can see a client to their discretion at a free, with no cost. Um, however, you know, the therapist itself have to, you know, they have to maintain themselves as well. So not many therapists do free pro bono work. Um, however, I do feel like cost is very, um, it's very expensive therapy. So therefore, when you think about like, oh yeah, go to a therapist. Well, I don't have $160 per session to pay a therapist, you know? And also a lot of the people in the Latinx community, if they are undocumented or they don't have insurance or, you know, all these other things, the more likely you're not going to seek a therapist because you don't have the resources to do that. Also, there's a uh, distrust within. Uh, so being a therapist, that is a figure of authority. And with the Latinx community, there's a distrust with people in authority. You know, being, if you're an immigrant and you've been through that process, you know, the more likely you're, you're going to think of a therapist. And my clients, Latina clients have told me straight up, like, you're part of the system. Meaning that, oh, you're going to report me. You're going to report me to CPS. You're going to report me to the system. You're going to call eyes on me. Like, all like it's part of a bigger issue especially when it comes to our community and having those um the political climate and the immigration issues that we are facing nowadays um also there's a lack of trust in the sense that you know we are taught ever since we're young that we need to keep everything within our family so why do i need a therapist when i can just fix it within my family i don't need them and plus they're expensive so therefore let me just keep it in my family and also there might be a language barrier. 
So if, if you don't look like me, if you don't sound like me, how could you relate to me? So most, these are most of the barriers that I have encountered. Just overall, it doesn't have to allocate to gender, just like within the Latino community, Latinx community. So um, what's with everything that you mentioned being some of the barriers that uh, the Latinx community um, has, you know, compared to other cult cultural backgrounds, mm -hmm. what is the most common mental health problem or issue most of your Latinx clients have that you've seen? Since most of my, and again, to every, anyone here listening to this podcast, obviously most of these questions are going to be based on my experience. That might be not the experience of other therapists, and specifically that I am practicing in Grand Rapids, Michigan too. You have to think about um, demographics. So in my experience, when I, one of my jobs I did was working at, um, I was circle and I was working for the Strong Beginnings program. And that program was basically for Latino women. So most of the Latino women that I was seeing, most of them had depression, anxiety, PTSD, postpartum depression, and um, trauma usually related to their partners or like to their, like their spouse or whoever they're with at the time. Okay. So it sounds like you, um, it's not like that's just your personal experience because of the, maybe the type of program you were assigned to at the time you were working mm -hmm. with. So those mm -hmm. were the people that would come into your office seeking therapy for those specific reasons, because those were assigned to you. Correct. Okay. Interesting. So now I'm also interested to know, what is the age range of Latinx clients you work with the most? I want to say there's a range from like 16 years old to 50, but mainly women in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. Do you think there's a correlation as to like why that's the age range, age range you treat? Um. Not necessarily a correlation, but I feel like in those age brackets, there are certain things developmentally going on um, and also different milestones that you're going that are going on in your life as a woman. So the problems that a 20 year old might have are not the same that a 30 year old and a 40 year old are going to have. If Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, definitely. That's why I wanted to know, because, um, you know, like the, the age range you pretty much um, mentioned sounds like like the age range age range in which like we like let's say like the three of us are in and i know that like we have gone through specific milestones right like like you have you don't have kids like you know rosie and i have kids and we're married like you're not married but things like that um obviously correlate to like whatever's happening in our lives and that's what we seek therapy for you know those type of milestones depending on how they go in our lives i'm assuming mm -hmm. right mm-hmm mm -hmm. So the next question is, um, do you find yourself having the, uh, to convince the Latinx individuals around you? So like maybe like your family, your friends, or like work colleagues um, to ask them to actually go to therapy if they're experiencing mental health related issues. And if so, um, why do you think you, you have to force them? Like you, you find yourself having to like um, tell them like, you need to go find therapy. And I can't, and by the way, I can't be your therapist because you know, whatever ethical, you know, things may happen because you, you know that person already. So like, what, like, does that happen? And like, why do you think that happens? Um, yes and no, in the sense that I feel like I find myself educating them more about certain disorders and what the symptoms look like, and then remind them that although I am a therapist, I cannot be their therapist due to the conflict of interest but they still want my expertise regardless. So I find myself not necessarily telling them to go to therapy, but more explaining to them. Like they'll come to me and be like, hey, like this is what I have going on. And then, I, I mean, I'm a therapist. I can help but like, you know, see these signs and symptoms. And I'm like, you know what? I think you will benefit more from like actually getting a consultation from a therapist or going to therapy. But then they're like, but you are one. So why can you just tell me? But it just doesn't work like that. And honestly, I don't want to be the therapist of the people in my life. Yeah, that would be a very interesting thing, thing to do and have to live with, you know, like if you... No, and you also have to take into account that in order to be a good therapist, you can be biased. And if I'm 
you know, doing therapy with people that I know, I already know way more information than a normal therapist would. And how helpful would I be to them if I know all this background information? So that's why you don't, you don't do that. You need to go to someone that has a clear picture, um, doesn't know everything about you so that therefore they're not as biased and they can be good to you. That makes perfect sense. Thank you. So it does make a lot of sense. Um, so keep that in mind, chicas, when you're choosing your therapist. And remember, your friends are not your therapists. Seek help, yes. <laughs> professional help. Yes, I think I personally have to have had learned that the hard way. <laughs> so leading on to the next question is, based on our experience, it seems like there may be a lack of awareness and education in the Latinx community about mental health. So with that said, what are some of the other barriers you see there may be in the community about it. And, and I think before you answer, before you answer that question, Loa, um, referring back to what you mentioned earlier, like when we say like, it seems like we're not educated to know like that well to know the difference between, as you mentioned earlier, like a psychiatrist and like a therapist. So a lot of people think, especially Latinos, like, and, and, the, and I, I would say like the older people, right? Like our parents, our grandparents, they feel like when you say therapist, um, it's like, un, you know, like, like porque tu loco, you're going to, to, to a therapist. And so the, I think the difference, like, I don't think they know the difference between someone who, who actually prescribe you because you are maybe like you do have other problems um, than someone you're just going to talk to um, about what's happening in your life or whatever issues you have so they can advise you to see like what are some of the things you could do to you know to get out of that you know uh, mentality or to help you know whatever what, whatever that mental thing is but I feel like that's you know that's one of the things that like remembering to what you said earlier I'm like yeah like we just we don't know like they don't know that a psychiatrist like it's different than a therapist so like what other things do you see that we need to educate people on that they don't know about? Um, I feel like, and I'm not, I don't want to get super technical and like overwhelm people with the information, but there's a lot of different, um, licenses out there. So like LMSWs, which are, they are social workers, but social workers can also be therapists too. There's also LPCs, which are limited professional counselors. They also do therapy, you know? So TLPs like me, we are temporary limited licensed psychologists. We also do therapy. So again, each um, license just determines certain um, requirements when you do, when you're getting your education, certain requirements that you need to meet. And also each therapist may have a specific um, certification or a specific background. So that's why it's very important for when you're looking for a therapist to make sure what are they focusing on? Like what is their certification? Do they have a specialty in something? Um, and also, like you said, knowing the difference because we can, so therapists overall, we see you to deal with an issue, with a mental illness, um, with a disorder. But if through therapy, we find out that therapy is not enough and then medicine need to be in, um, uh, in a treatment base, aside from getting the therapy, also have medication. A lot of people are opposed to that and also getting education about medication, but that's when the psychiatrists come in. So we can help you link those dots too. So not only can we help you guide you through whatever issue or circumstance you're going through, but we can connect you to those people that if you are in need of medication, they can get you to. But per, on that I know so far, people at a therapist level, we do not prescribe medication. And I think going back to the, uh, to the question, the main question that you asked, um, like I mentioned before, it goes beyond the lack of awareness. It's also, it also includes, you know, the political climate that we live in, the lack of trust, insurance issues, resources issues, because there's so, you have to think about also the area where you're practicing. So luckily in Grand Rapids, although there's a big Hispanic population, there are not many people that are bilingual therapists. We're very outsourced, you know? And even if we're here, not many people know about us. So, and us as a therapist having the resources to promote ourselves and let them know like, hey, we are here to help you. Um, although we might be here, 
some people might not come to us, even when you're telling them, hey, I speak Spanish, I look like you, I sound like you, and I can help you, they might still not because of the lack of education or because of being shamed by their um, groups, by their friends, by especially like in the Latino, the male population. If a guy tells another guy, oh, I want to see my therapist, and I'm telling you from experience that I hear men in my circle, like, they start shaming the other male for seeking therapy and not even males, also women like, oh, you need to talk to your mom because I don't know why you're going to a therapist, you know, and like they shame you. So therefore the least likely you're going to end up going to therapy. Or even if you were thinking about going to therapy, you're like, oh, but so-and-so, who, what are they going to think? What are they going to say? First of all, no one needs to know that you're going to therapy. That is your personal issue. That is your personal thing. You don't need to share that with anyone. Um, but also as women, we need to uplift each other, encourage each other instead of shaming each other for actually seeking the help that we need. I agree. Preach it, girl. So um, the next question, it's more about Latina millennials like us. And um, I think that personally, I feel like you would think that because we are, I, I guess like Latina millennials are more in our, in our age range, I would say. Um, are more educated at, you know, as like most of like our maybe like um, older, you know, generation, like the Latinas. Um, So you would think that we would seek because we know and are more educated about all these things, right? Like we went to college, we got a degree and we like, you know, we have a good job and like we work in a corporation or a a nonprofit or whatever it may be. You would think that because we know that and we're educated we would you know if something's happening with us like we would seek therapy right easier than like anyone else so the question is do you think that latina millennials are more open to seek therapy than the older generation of women if they're struggling with mental health issues like has that been your experience or what what are your thoughts about that um in my experience i want to say yes Although there is a lack of awareness when it comes to mental health in the Latinx community, there is also a new influx of openness and more feeling and feeling more okay about asking for help and seeking mental health among millennials. In my opinion and within my circle of friends, the more likely even I I can tell you like when I talk to like my sorority sisters or like my you guys and people in my circle in my circle, the more the more I educate them about it and the more I make them feel okay with, you know. It, this is a real thing. It is happening and it's okay for you to seek professional help. I think the more you talk about it, the more you normalize it, the more likely that person is to be like, okay, this is an okay thing to do. Like it, it's not wrong or like, I'm not going to be shame or like burn at the stake or something like that. You know, the more you talk about it, the more it becomes the, the stigma size, the more people are willing to do it. But I do feel like more people like millennials are more, inclined to seek therapy than older women that's good to know know. yeah so i'm very intrigued to hear to and learn more about this question from your answer so how do we know if we have a mental disorder or illness (laughs) i know that's like a loaded question right (laughs) it is it is um that's a hard question because oftentimes we feel overall like as humans that we are just going through a rough patch or this is temporary or like I'm just having enough week but a week becomes a month a month becomes a year you know and you just shove it off shove it off shove it off so it's hard <laughs> in the sense that in order for you to know that there's something wrong if you don't if you're not educated about mental health illness how, how do you know you know um so I think you have to be aware of like signs that usually will lead to diagnosis and what kind of symptoms your experiences and change in behavior, length of the symptoms and behavior, sleep um, patterns, eating changes. Like it could, it takes a lot for someone to figure out, you know, shit, there's something wrong with me. And sometimes if we are not educated, we don't know about it. How can we jump to those conclusions? So I think at the end of the day, it comes down to the people around you that know you, that are able to check on you and be like, hey, I, I, I know you for this long and I can tell there's something off or there's something wrong. I feel like you need to talk. Like the more we talk to other people about it, our struggle, what we're going through, the more likely those people are going to tell you like, hey, yes, I've been noticing that too. 
and the more likely you're, you're likely to be like, okay, maybe I need further help. Obviously, I've been doing these behaviors for X amount of time and nothing has changed. So let me seek professional help or a consultation, you know, just to make sure there's nothing wrong or like, you know, or maybe you do know deep down your gut is telling you like, you know, there's something wrong. And at the end of the day, when we're going through stuff, no one wants to admit there's something wrong with them. We all want to be normal, whatever that means, you know? So it's hard admitting to ourselves that, you know, I do have depression or I do have anxiety. And also within the Latinx community, all usually mental health um, issues, um, they show in your body, like as a physical illness, like, oh, you know, my head hurts a lot, like my body's aching, I'm sleeping more, but they just allude that to like oh I just worked out super hard yesterday that's why my body's feeling the way that it is or I'm tired but those are signs of depression again if you don't educate yourself and you don't know about these things the more likely you are to just brush it off this is a patch I'm going through something I'll get over it wow that's great thank you for letting us know because I am pretty sure there's a lot of people out there that may be feeling like you know, they're tired or like all those symptoms you just, you just mentioned and they, and they it may be, you know, worse than what they think it is. And they haven't really, you know, um, taken the time to, to search, you know, to go to someone and maybe like, um, see and identify whether or not it would be, it's more of a like mental health thing rather than just like a physical thing. And, you know, so. I think as part of a human coping mechanism, it's like when we're going through something or feeling something, you try to come up with excuses about it. Like, if my head hurts, like, oh, it's only been a day, it'll go away. Or like, use whatever excuse you make up within yourself to make sure that you're coping and doing okay. That's why the more you talk to other people, that's when people usually check you like, dude that's not normal. Like you need to seek help. So the more you talk to it about it to someone else, the more likely you're get you are to get the help that you need. As to if you just hold it in and you're just battling with it, the more you're gonna rot inside in a way, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is a very loaded question as well. Um, so uh, we'll see what you let us know about this, but or your answer, what that may be. But what precautions or, you know, steps may we take to avoid um, PTSD or depression or any other mental health disorder that someone may have? Like, or is that, is that even a valid question to ask you? Or is that like unique per disorder? Well, then, um, <laughs> I think it's a valid question. However, each of these disorders and illnesses that you mentioned are different but they also can overlap each other or be co-occurring. And when I say co-occurring, meaning that both of them can be happening at the same time. So, or all of them, I can have PTSD, be depressed and have anxiety. So you might not be able to treat them all the same in the sense that, or some of this disorder, even more than the ones that you mentioned can be predisposed or genetic or have a genetic predisposition. And when I say predisposed, meaning like with substance abuse, if your mom and dad has substance abuse in the past, or like your mom was um, doing substances while she was pregnant, you know, some of these illnesses you might be prone to just because genetically they already happen. You know, even if you are not an alcoholic or X, Y, and C, you can be more prone to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can have predisposition if you have a family history of depression, anxiety, postpartum, and all these other things. So um, it depends also on the intensity of your symptoms. You know, you can be dealing with depression and it just comes and go like, oh, you know, just once a month, I go through a day where I just feel like shit, you know. But if you are depressed, like every single day, like I don't enjoy the things I used to enjoy anymore. I can't sleep. I don't want to go out. I'm isolating for months. You know, you, you, I can't treat it if I, like a person that only has one day of depression a month. You, I, that other person that has all these other intensity of symptoms might need more help than the other one. So mental health is not a one size fits all. Each case is different and unique and you have to treat it as such. What works for one client might not work for another. So yes, it's a valid question, but at the same time, you have to treat each person individually and each um, disorder individually and each, you know, symptom, treatment, everything. It's per person. Thanks. 
Good to know. I I am blown away here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely learning so much. I hope que todas ustedes estén así como embelezada. <laughs> so you're listening. Rosie sure podcast. looks like she's embelezada. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I am. She looks I shocked. <laughs> I'm learning so much. So um, to keep going, to keep learning, what would you recommend the Latinas who are listening to this podcast to do if they do not currently have access to a bilingual or Latinx therapist? There's a lot of therapies that might not be physically feasible to you. However, there is telehealth. Um, and telehealth meaning, so especially now with COVID-19, most of like me right now, that's what, what I'm doing. I'm doing telehealth, which is doing therapy over virtually, like over a phone call or via Zoom, like, you know, virtually by this, a computer. Um, and if you don't have a therapist like within your area, so let's say I live in Grand Rapids, I'm a 26 year old female and I'm looking for a Latino or Latina therapist and I don't physically can get to them. If a therapist has their license within Michigan, you can find therapists if they live like in Holland, in I don't know, another another county, as long as their license is within the state, you can still see them. It doesn't have to be physically in person. So as long as the therapist is within your state, you can do telehealth. Some and also you have to think about insurances and how they cover each other and things like that. Um, and also there's a ton of support groups of online. Like if you're not ready for therapy, you might be able to find a group of women, of people, a community about certain depression and like anything. Like Google or the internet is a powerful tool. You just have to get on it if you really need the help and look for it. Also, there's a ton of apps about uh, mental health that you can just, uh, a second away, you can just log in, create an account, and someone can talk to you anywhere, you know? So there's many, many, many ways that you can find help. It's just you getting out of your comfort zone and actually looking for the resources. Wow, that's actually something that I, I actually learned today that I did not know about. And, and that was probably the reason why I asked the question, because I was thinking like, but what if someone, you know, that's not maybe like here in the area um, and like really, really need someone to talk to, um, but they, you know, they don't know how to find that person or like that person is not as close to them um, for them to talk to them. Like what, what else could you do? But like all those things, all those resources that you mentioned, like I had no idea they existed. So saber que eso es algo que existe allá afuera, que no tiene que ser necesariamente con una gente que tú con una persona que con un terapista que, que, que practique en tu propio en tu propio um, tu propia ciudad um, y sabe que hay grupos allá afuera o que hay una aplicación que tú puedes llenar y que tú verdad y alguien randomly you know te, te pregunta te hace preguntas y te dice okay qué 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 será lo que está pasando and, and you just like vent and talk to someone like that's I right there uh, therapy um, I think it's very important to know because I don't think a lot of people know that that's something you can do especially for people que no quiere like maybe do face to face with someone mm -hmm. they don't trust that person right like or or someone that lives in the area because they're like oh I'm 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 afraid that like I don't know at some point I'm gonna see that person and then they're gonna know everything about me like randomly la calle lo yo lo va a ver like it's like oh my gosh you know that person knows everything I you know I told them about my life but knowing that there's other people like maybe on their internet that you know you're never gonna see it's I think it's very helpful because a lot of people especially like you know Latinx people would probably feel a lot better you know as a starter maybe that way and then like move on to like okay I'm ready to see someone like face to face and, and talk to them but also within that comes another hurdle in the sense that yeah, I have this resource, but especially, at least, again, I'm thinking about my demographics and the people that I serve in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area, the, especially in the Latinx community. And right now with COVID and everything being um, virtual and needing access to a computer and internet, a lot of the Latinx people, they don't have this, this means. They don't have access to internet. They don't have access to a computer. And then what do you do? You know, so it, it goes beyond the lack of education. It also adds on to lack of resources. Like, yeah, I'm here, but I don't know how many people in, in Grand Rapids know that there are more than one. Like, I'm not the only Dominican Latina therapist in Grand Rapids. 
there's like five more people with the same um, ethnicity as me that are servicing my community just like I am too. So again, it's lack of resources. If, yeah, I'm here, but how do people know about me? That's another issue, like how the people that don't have access to the internet can have access to these resources that I'm telling you right now. And obviously this is a bigger issue to a bigger question to that I don't have the answers to. That makes sense. Well, thanks for sharing that though, because it's, it's very, I think it's, it's, a, it's a valid thing to say and it's very important just because it's, it's more, it's beyond, you know, what we're talking about here. Like it's beyond the three of us to like mm -hmm. fix these problems or these issues, you know, the lack of resources for the community. Um, then, you know, like, you know, like it's bigger than that. Like, I guess that's, yeah, it's good to know though, because I, I think it's eye opening for other people to know that like, um, yeah, like there's the lack of awareness, but you know, there's also the lack of like, how do we actually get those resources? Um, that's a lot more important, I guess. And I think that's one of my biggest, um, that's when I feel the most helpless when I have, I have all this to offer yet. I have a lot of people that I cannot get to, if that makes sense, or they cannot get to me because there's so many um, barriers. And I'm only putting this out there because whoever's listening and has idea, please, by all means. This is, I'm sure this is not the only community that shares the same issues. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So um, we've mentioned a little bit of um, COVID-19, you know, the whole pandemic thing that we are going through right now for the past few months and it's obviously been a different type of environment and a different way of living and a different way of doing a lot of different things that we are used to we were used to doing before this whole pandemic started that now we're like forced to basically like learn how to do these things you know like within the compounds of like our home or whatever so mm -hmm. with that there's a lot of us women who are struggling more than ever because we're playing many roles, as you know. We are, you know, moms, we're wives, we are employees, we are pretty much everything right now. And it's really hard to com compartmentalize, you know, and keep everything like, okay, balanced out. Like, okay, now I'm going to be the mom, now I'm going to be the wife, now I'm going to be the employee. Like, there's just no way. that does, It doesn't work that way. So You're wearing many hats. <laughs> right. So with your experience, what what would you recommend um, we do if we're feeling stressed out and overworked and tired and we just don't know what to do because because we 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 we're wearing all those hats at the same time? There's a million things that I can tell you, <laughs> and there's tons of resources out there. So hang in here with me. The fo the following suggestions um, that I'm gonna give you guys can be used overall for self care for mental health stability, but obviously this is gonna have a focus more on our current situation in COVID-19. But just know, just because I'm talking about this topic doesn't mean that you can do this thing for certain other things within your mental health life. So one of the first thing that I would suggest, sleep. Maintain a regular sleep schedule. I know you guys probably hear this on a daily basis, but honestly, it is important. I know it's hard, it's easier said than done, but in order for you to be able to function at a normal level or at a you know good level to be good to others and be able to perform in your work, you need a sleep schedule and a regular one. Also routines, especially during this time, the more you keep your usual routine, your normal routine to the best of your abilities, obviously, the more likely it will be easier for you to engage back into that same routine. And that routine not only goes for you, but also your household. And for you women that have children too. If you don't have a routine, how do you expect your children to have a routine and be functional too if you guys are a hot mess? So maintaining the same routine that you used to have before in some type of way, uh, it will help you and the people in your household. Also communicate with those around you and tell them your needs. People, men are not mind readers, especially you, us women, I know, we're like, telepathically we're telling them you're supposed to know this no you need to <laughs> verbalize it you need to tell your partner this is what i need this is what i want because they're not just gonna assume that's what you wanted sorry that's, i need to call you guys out <laughs> no but i agree because personally i think that's one thing i 
I struggle with that I usually assume that like he's supposed to know the things that I need or he's supposed to know that he's you know he needs to be doing certain things but you're right like if I don't tell him what I want and what I need it's gonna be really difficult for him to be able to support me and help me so I completely agree and I am very guilty you know (laughs) as guilty as charged of that of assuming that he knows everything I need and the support I need from him and you're right like we absolutely have to be telling our partners what we need because um again men are men and even if they're men I think that as human beings it's just like not safe to assume that someone knows what you need and you know it takes a village you know especially to maintain a household you need to communicate you need to work as a a unit in order to also help the little ones too because if you think I can do it all, I'm superwoman, that's why you get burned out and bitchy and <laughs> aggravated and no one, you know, like, yo, check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I am guilty of all of that. So, yes. This also, is like- <laughs> yes, identify those things which you do not have control over and do the best you can with the resources you have available to you. Remember, you cannot control the pandemic. You cannot control if you get infected, you know? I mean, I hope you're doing the safety, the staying at your home, you know, some distance wise, six feet apart and all that. But at the end of the day, you can't control it at all. So remind yourself, this is what I can control and these other factors I cannot and let those go because you will drive yourself ragged and crazy. Take breaks from work to stretch, to exercise, or check in with your supportive colleagues, your coworkers, your family, your friends. Spend time outdoors, either being physically active or relaxing. Some ideas of how to move could be walking, stretching, dancing, doing yoga, doing cardiovascular exercises. And also don't think about, yeah, you're probably like, oh, she's offering all these things. Well, those things aren't free. If you go to YouTube, there's tons of videos that are free. They are a click away. Again, if you have a means to internet and a computer, obviously. But try free exercises on YouTube. They have yoga. They have like Zumba. They have dance exercise, Pilates, cardio, HIIT exercise. So it's just a matter of you wanting to do it and looking for those resources. And if you don't, on Instagram, on Facebook, there's tons of group and tons of um influential people that do like free videos like on IG so those are things that you can be in the lookout for um if you work from home set a regular time to end your work day if possible because people are like oh I'm working from home and you're like cooking putting the doing the laundry mapping like and next thing you know it's 10 p.m and it's like do you really work until 10 p.m on a normal day no so check yourself Make a routine, end your day. If you usually end at 4.30, end at 4.30. Guess what? Next day when you log in back into your computer, your workload is still going to be there. Agreed. Thank you for that reminder. Yes. Um, also, practice mindfulness techniques. I know uh, many people sometimes don't know about this, and it might work from some people. It might not work from other. But mindfulness is a way of practicing awareness that can reduce stress. It involves focusing on your attention on the present moment and accepting it without judgment. And right now, I'm going to give you some meditation apps that you can download on your phone. This is not sponsored. I'm just giving it to you because, you know, I'm a good ass therapist. (laughs) And I'm just giving you resources. Um, But if you have an Android, uh, uh, iPhone, whatever you have, these are free downloadable apps for meditation or just for mental health or relaxation, things that will prompt you to do these things without you having to go crazy and be like, I don't know how to meditate. They will prompt you and tell you, you know, step by step how to do these things. So the first one is called Headspace. It is free and some of the content you might have to pay for after you do a certain amount of it. The second one is called Calm. It's also free. Um, The next one is Simple Habit. The next one is Intimind, I-N-T-I-M-I-M-D. And this one is offered in Spanish. Nice. The next one is called Livery. This is free content created by and for people in the Black and African communities. So there's even apps specifically um, aimed for certain communities too. There's a tons of resources. There's Relaxed Light. 
Um, I personally have that one myself. And Calm, I have myself too. And Headspace, I have myself too. The last one is My Life Meditation. It's also free. All of this, I'm telling you, just download it. And it will, you probably create an account, you know, to keep up with your progress. But it will tell you literally how to do these things for you to cope. And honestly, when you think of meditation, I want you to think it doesn't take hours. It could be one minute. It could be five minutes. It, it, it's up to you. As long as you take the time for yourself to do this for yourself. Because at the end of the day, you're helping you. Do you recommend, um, now that you, you're talking about mindfulness and like meditation, like is there a specific time of the day that you would recommend people do this? Or like, could you just randomly, you know, do it throughout the day? Like, or there's a specific time that you're like, you know, you know, when you wake up in the morning, like maybe that's the first thing you do. Or when you, before you go to bed at night, maybe that's like a, you know, a, a something that you might want to do. Or what's your take on that? Honestly, it depends on the person and like how you're feeling. So personally, myself, I do it before I go to sleep because in my uh, experience, I have a hard time going to sleep. Like I start ruminating about my day, coulda, woulda, shoulda type of thing, you know. I'm just like, I could have done this. Like the day is done and over with. Like you need to go to sleep. But you know, it's like sometimes I wish I had, I wish I had a switch where I'm just like, okay, up, let me do this. But it doesn't work like that. We all know that. So I find it helpful when I do it. I usually just take like chamomile tea. I lay down, listen to the, put my app on. And you guys, I swear to you, in less than two minutes, I'm done for. Like I'm knocked down to the next day. But again, it takes practice and it might not work for you right on this path. Some people might want to start their day in a positive note and want to be intentional. So it might be beneficial for you to start a meditation at the beginning of your day. Or let's say you do work at a stressful like work and you need, you know what, every, in my 15 minute break, I'm going to do a meditation session just because, you know, I'm not trying to cuss out so-and-so via email or like, you know, I have this next Zoom meeting that I'm not trying to spaz on someone. So you need to do whatever you need to do for yourself. So when, whenever you feel like you need a break, do a meditation here and there. Does that answer your question? Um, so aside from meditation, there's also breathing exercises. All those apps that I told you about, they also focus on breathing exercises. Breathing exercises can help calm your body and your mind. And these exercises often involve controlling and slowing your breath. So also being aware of your moment, being aware of your body, being aware of maybe any pain that you might be feeling too. Also do things that you enjoy during non-work hours. So when you can do things that you enjoy and that help you relax, like reading a book, listening to an audiobook, many public libraries right now, um, they offer free audiobooks. Um, <laughs> learn a new skill, create art, like drawing, building something with your kids too. You can involve your kids too. That's a time you can kill two birds with one stone type of thing. You're relaxing yourself, but you're also helping your child do something at the same time journaling and writing. I cannot stress the importance of journaling. I know people don't like it. I know some people are like, oh no, that's just, you know, psycho babble. No, people, like it works, it helps, try it and then come back to me. <laughs> also playing a puzzle or a game, taking an online course. There's tons of free online course now because of what's going on that are being offered to you a free cause. Do tasks around your home, like organize, do crafts, garden, rearrange your living space. Um, your closet. I just cleaned out my entire closet because I had so much time in my hands. And I've been meaning to do it, but I never had the time. But now, you know, I have no excuse. So do something that you've been dreading to do now because you're stuck at home. You have nothing better to do. Cook something new with ingredients you have at home or like, like I myself, Pinterest is my best friend. I have my list of like desserts that I want to create or even like um, recipes, new recipes that I want to create. And honestly, I love that self-care for me. Cooking just relaxes me, helps me. I do it on my own time. If it comes out good, great. And if it doesn't, well, you know, there's the trash too. It's okay. Remind yourself that each of us has a crucial role in fighting this pandemic. Remind yourself that everyone is in an unusual situation with limited resources. Take breaks from watching and reading and listening to the news stories, including social media. Hearing about the pandemic repeatedly can be upsetting and mentally exhausting. Connect with others. Talk with people who you trust 
about your concerns, how you're feeling, or how you how the pandemic is affecting you and your life and your family. Um, connect with others via phone call, email, text, mailing letters, like cards, video chat. There's so many ways that you can connect with others without having to do it physically. Check on other. It's just not, it's a two-way street. It's just not about you. There's also other people that are by themselves, that are elderly. Check on your grandma, check on your comadre, check on people around you. Because just, you might be going through it, but guess what? We're all going through it too. So make sure that you're checking on those two that might that might not have the resources that you do. Um, offer help to others if you can. Um, ask for help when you need it. If talking about COVID-19 is affecting your mental health, set boundaries with people about how much and when you want to talk about COVID-19. You need a balance about those topics. Like, yeah, it's happening, but you don't have to talk about it every single day. And more so when that's something that we have no control over in the sense that it continues to happen. The stay at home orders are continue to be extended. The more anxious we're getting. So boundaries, create boundaries within yourself, with the people around you and your family members too. It, it's okay. Um, and do virtual activities together, like um, do coffee um, breaks, do, do cocktail hours. People are getting super creative and like playing virtual games. I know Rosie and Jana play, what's the name of the games? <laughs> Not that oh, we're so, sponsored. You know, we're not sponsored at all. Not but, yet. <laughs> Trago was a really good game that you can play among um, a few people and specifically for Hispanics. So it's a lot better because it's it's a, a game that would um, knows about our background and they leverage that background so that you can have a really nice, you know, like um, time to relax and play a game that, you know, would be like about yourself as like Latinx community. Like I know people too that do like um, wine and paint type of thing, like virtually, like we'll get the FaceTime going, you do your thing while your other friend is on the other side. Um, there's people that read books to each other. There's people that sometimes right now they're doing a lot of free concerts on online. So, you know, casting to the same thing and having each other on the background. There's applications now that are, um, I don't know the name of the application, but it's like it's it's virtual, but this there's a game with within the um party. Yes, yes, yes. So you know you're still having fun, and sometimes you know communication can be dry, so you can play a game too and be entertained, and you know connect with those people on another level too. Also, with my sorority sisters, I know some of them they do um they exercise they'll put each other and they do the same workout routine and they're connecting that way you know you have to think outside the box you know we're living in very peculiar times you know and you have to get creative and there's tons of other things that you can do you know so like i'm sure dan and rose are gonna share my information with you so feel free to reach out if you need any ideas or anything like that or even to rosy and Janna. <laughs> i agree well thank you for that Thank vast you. variety of things that we can do while being home and being moms and all these other things that we're supposed to be doing but taking making sure that we're taking a break to do all those things mm -hmm. so we only have two questions for you because we know it's it's get it, it's gotten longer but it's been a great interview so far and we've learned a lot so um rose is going to ask you um the next question and i'll ask the last one yes ladies make sure you rewind to make sure you get down all these like all this information i started taking notes and i'm like okay i'm gonna have to come back and listen to this <laughs> i know i gave a lot of resources but oh, that's no, the thing that's i don't want you guys to have an excuse like the problem is i don't know where these things are i told you them so you, exactly. have, you have this available and that's why i'm telling everyone please rewind <laughs> The back so, <laughs> with all of this man I'm, I'm over here also thinking like this is i'm so excited to have just learning all of this and the, i love this question because i feel like this is going to be something that john and i are going to have to keep like this is just a start of having you as a guest here today and learning so much so it comes down to is there something we can do as educated Latinas to support the, the stigmatizing mental health in our community? Um, educate yourself, 
your family and your circle about mental health and power and support each other and the men in your community too. It's not just about us women, it's also about the men too. And if someone reaches out for help, network and help them connect with someone who or to what they need. We need to help each other. In order for us to change this stigma, we have to make it um, known and to make it not shaming each other about what mental health is. Excellent. So ya saben, mujeres y chicos, to empower us to talk about it and not make us feel ashamed for it. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. So the last question of the podcast today in the interview is, if you could give Latina millennials advice about mental health, what would it be? Like everything you talked about was so important and so I think, you know, informational. But what would be one thing that you would want Latina millennials to know at the end of the day when it comes to mental health? Well, I'm an inclusive person, so this is not going to go out just to Latinas, millennial. This will go out to every single person and human being out here that is listening to this podcast. I wish everyone in the world could be listening to this podcast, but I know that's not reality. But mental health is real. It matters. And we are all living with it in some way, shape, or form. It's okay to ask for help. That does not make you weak, it makes you stronger. And please, please, please educate yourself so that you can educate others and help me end the stigma. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much for your time, Loana, and your commitment to helping our Latinx community understand more acerca de la salud mental and providing your services and resources a esos que más lo necesitan. So thank you so much for being here today. And a nuestras oyentes, Rosy, what do you want to tell them? Sí, que de todo corazón esperamos de que hayan disfrutado de este episodio porque yo sé que yo sí. <laughs> so asegúrense de siempre poner la salud mental primero and don't hesitate to seek a professional if you need help and support. Se nos cuidan. Chao. Hasta el próximo episodio. Bye.